Hey, good afternoon. We're going to ha go ahead and get started with today's QC COVID-19 press briefing. Um, today is Thursday, August 20th. Thank you all for joining us. Today we have Janet Hill, Chief Operating Officer with the Rock Island County Health Department. We also have Ed Rivers, Director of the Scott County Health Department. And joining us today, we have Dr. Daniel Arnold, Physician with Unity Point Health Trinity. We will have prepared statements from each of our speakers. So we encourage you, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. We will go to questions once the speakers have completed their statements, and we will go ahead and read those aloud. If your question pertains to one of the speakers in particular, please type that out as well, and we'll do our best to get to those as we get started. Um, so first, Janet, can we start with you? Can you please give us the case numbers for the day? Sure. Uh, today, we have 1,979 cases, and our total number of deaths is 50. Okay, Ed, can we please get the case numbers from you as well? In Scott County, we have 1,912 deaths, as reported by the Iowa Department of, uh, excuse me, 1,912 cases as reported by the Iowa Department of Public Health and 17 deaths. Our community is experiencing the effects of the surge in COVID-19 cases that took place during the month of July. This includes an increase of deaths, an increase of long-term care cases, and additional pressure to ensure that safety uh, for children as they return to the school setting. As of August 1st, uh, the Quad Cities area has experienced an increasing number of COVID-related deaths. Deaths are a lagging indicator of the severity of COVID-19 in our community, and we believe the recent increase in deaths are connected to increased virus spread that led to the spike in cases in July. The surge put the most vulnerable in our communities at additional risk for severe illness and death. Scott County has also experienced its second outbreak in a long-term care facility. Ridgecrest Village, in coordination with the Scott County Health Department and the Iowa Department of Public Health, have identified a total of three cases of COVID-19 in residents and staff. According to the Iowa Department of Public Health, an outbreak is defined as three or more cases of COVID-19 in a facility. No deaths have been associated with this outbreak. Facility has notified residents and their families and consistent with IDPH guidelines, the affected residents are in isolation. Rich Crest Village staff are working closely with Scott County Health Department to protect the health of all residents and staff. The focus of today's briefing will be on children in the school setting. Administrators and families are preparing themselves for the certainty that COVID-19 cases will be found in schools. Our local schools have developed plans to lessen the chance of COVID-19 exposure to students, teachers, and staff while in the school setting. However, COVID-19 is still spreading in our community and our schools will not be immune. Okay, next we'll hear from Janet Hill with Rock Island County Health Department on children in the school setting during the COVID pandemic. So we are assuming that there will be outbreaks in schools. So right now we are encouraging all families with school-age children to plan ahead for how they will handle child care work and other duties if their child becomes excluded from school because they are found to have COVID-19 or are told that their child has been a close contact to an individual with COVID-19. Right now, families are encouraged to talk with their employer about policies that are in place if they need to be away from work to take care of their child. We also want them, um, they should also uh, find someone else who can uh, take care of their child during this time and to make sure that this individual is not at high risk of severe illness should they get COVID-19. Uh, this includes people who are older, who have pre-existing pre health conditions, et cetera. We want them to plan for how they will meet their household needs during this time, including grocery shopping, and using curbside pickup for delivery and pharmacy trips. Um, and we also want them to think about the following scenarios related to COVID-19, which would require a child to be out of school for a set time period. 
if your child tests positive for COVID-19 or has symptoms of COVID-19, the child will need to stay home for a minimum of 10 days. If your child has been exposed or is a close contact with someone with COVID-19, either in the school setting or from someplace outside of the school, the child will need to stay home for a period of 14 days. School is not, only the only, is, is not the only setting where children will be in contact with others outside of their household and therefore at risk for COVID-19. Families have lives outside of school as well. We encourage families to take a look at the activities they participate in outside of the school setting. We all enjoy family gatherings, slumber parties, outdoor barbecues with neighbors, but these types of activities increase the risk of being exposed to COVID-19. Because it takes anywhere between two and 14 days before someone develops symptoms or even knows that he or she has COVID-19, a child could unknowingly bring the virus to school and expose others. Beyond staying at home with members of your household only, there are hardly any activities that have no COVID risk. So please just be careful as to which activities you and your family participate in. We encourage everyone in our community to support our schools and extend them grace during these challenging times. Our school administrators and staff have invested countless hours and, and work time to be prepared to respond to endless numbers of scenarios related to COVID-19 that could come their way. Please know that both the Rock Island and Scott County Health Departments will support our local schools and their families every step of the way. Please do your part. Talk with your children about the importance of precautions that schools are putting in place, such as wearing masks and distancing of students while in the school setting. Have them practice wearing masks for times longer than just a couple hours. Don't wait until the first day of in-person school. Explain to them the importance of hand washing and covering their cough. And please make sure you keep your children home when they show signs of illness. We know this isn't what we had hoped for for the start of the school year. My sweet little niece started kindergarten this week. Her mom took the requisite first day of school photo outside and they went to the kitchen table to log into her Zoom lesson. That's not how it's supposed to be. It's okay to mourn what should have been. It's not okay to ignore our reality and forge your head like nothing has changed. Our kids take our cues from us. Please help them adapt both physically and mentally. Grace and compassion will go a long way to making this scary time a little easier. Thank you both Janet and Ed. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Daniel Arnold with Unity Point Health Trinity. Please go ahead, Dr. Arnold. Can you unmute yourself? There we go. So okay, I've been asked, good. Yeah, excellent. So I, I've been asked to discuss a couple uh, topics or questions as far as uh, uh, what uh, we're doing from our standpoint. Um, so one of the questions that we have here is what symptoms are we seeing in kids with COVID? Um, I said, we haven't seen a, a rash of them. I've seen a couple teenagers, but uh, not tons and tons of kids. Really, they're, they uh, so far, we're seeing people who are exposed and then test positive. But what we do see, things like fever, cough, sore throat, upset stomach or diarrhea. And uh, one that we're seeing in teenagers is loss of taste and smell. That one there seems to be relatively specific for COVID. Um, another topic I was asked to talk about is some tips for parents. Um, tips for parents who suspect that their kids may have uh, COVID-19. Uh, one is contact your primary care provider if you have one. Uh, see what their uh, recommendations are. They may want that child to be tested, uh, especially if there is, especially if there's symptoms present. The um, um, let's see here. Other things for uh, the parents is. Um, discuss early on uh, tips with your kids to do things to help stop the spread of COVID. Because in a lot of times this is an asymptomatic uh, infection in kids, the, you almost have to assume all the time that everybody has COVID. So you need to do the social distancing of uh, six feet. Uh, you need to be hand washing. That's something that even as healthcare professionals, uh, we need to be vigilant about 
if you touch your mask, um, if you cough or sneeze, you need to be reaching for that hand sanitizer. Uh, let's see here, what else? Um, things that providers are doing for flu and COVID season. One of the things we're doing is really encouraging flu shots this year. One of the issues we have is we really don't have any experience whatsoever what it's gonna look like if you have a co-infection with flu and COVID. So because we don't know what that's gonna look like, one of our strongest weapons right now is going to be getting those flu shots so that uh, we hopefully don't have to deal with a co-infection of flu and COVID. Um, so we really want those flu shots to be, to be uh, really given this year, uh, even more than, than most years. Um, one another question here is what, uh, what, because we have COVID-19 and flu in the same season this year, what can we expect? One of the, if there's a silver lining to this whole scenario, um, a lot of the things that we have in place for COVID-19 are the same things that we should have in place to help reduce the influence of flu uh, for the year. So. Uh, hand washing, uh, social distancing. If you're sick, stay home. You know, these are things that in a flu season we may or may not be great at doing, but because uh, we have COVID-19 uh, in place this year, uh, we're more likely to do these things. Wearing a mask may have a large impact in, in whether flu is transmitted this year. So best case scenario, if we do a great job of, of helping to prevent COVID, we may get lucky and have a light flu season. I'm really hoping that's the case. Thank you so much for sharing that important information. Um, we're grateful to have sort of that medical perspective along with our public health messaging about how families can prepare for what is not an if, but most likely a when um, for COVID in and amongst um, families and possibly schools as well. And we are going to start looking into the chat for any questions. We encourage um, any of our media on the call, please type questions that you have for our panelists into there and we will go ahead and get to them. Um, our first two questions we received actually prior to the call. So I'm going to go to those first. Um, these are going to be for public health. So Ed, perhaps you can um, start with these questions. This is about COVID-19 and a vaccine. A lot of people think once we get a vaccine, the crisis is over. Even if one is found, why is a single vaccine unlikely to end the pandemic? You put this question to Dr. Louis Katz, our medical director, and he indicated that it's too early to have an understanding of how the availability of a vaccine may affect the spread of this disease. Uh, only after more data is available may this be well understood. Um, and then another connected question, a poll out this week found that at least 25% of, I'm assuming it's um, Americans, won't get vaccinated. What's the impact of a sizable portion of the population refusing to be vaccinated? Dr. Katz indicated that, of course, those who do not accept the vaccine will remain at risk of infection and illness, including respiratory failure and death. However, at 75% acceptance of the vaccine, transmissions in the general population would be unlikely to result in sustained transmission. And this is what's referred to as herd immunity. Thank you, Ed. Okay, now going into the chat, there's some questions here. Um, and this is going, we'll go to Dr. Arnold. If we have anybody else who can chime in, please go ahead. Could there have been co-infections of COVID and flu last winter and spring? I know we've heard anecdotal comments from individuals who may have tested for influenza and it came back negative, but had some symptoms happening. Um, I, I don't know the official numbers of people who, of co-infections from last season. I know me personally, I can't recall that I've had one yet to where I had a, a positive flu and a positive COVID-19, but there is, no reason why you cannot have both at the same time. And if they're both circulating in the community, I mean, um, we've had flu and strep at the same time and, and uh, it happens. It's not common, but it definitely happens. So um, I, I wouldn't see any reason why you could not have a co-infection. 
Um, Janet, there's a question on here regards to local schools. We can possibly start with you on this one. How early do you believe we could see COVID-19 infections in the local schools? I think that we could possibly see it in very early in the first week or so where there have been many schools across the country that on the very first day um, they've had to send kids home. So we know it's circulating widely in the community and there's absolutely no reason to believe that it's not circulating um, among our school age kids too. Next question, Dr. Arnold, I'll put this one to you. Um, you mentioned a little bit of this. Did doctors and other primary care providers learn anything that would help going into this flu season? You mentioned some of the prevention me measures. I don't know if you want to reiterate that or if there's anything else that's been learned that might be helpful. Absolutely. And you know, the big one, of course, is, is get your flu shot. Um, that's probably one of the best ways to, to knock down the incidence of flu in the flu season. Uh, hand washing. Another big one, once again, is if you're sick, stay home. Don't go to the office sick. I know I'm, you know, guilty of that. If, if you're not running a fever, but you have a runny nose and you, you know, you, you wear a mask and go to work sick, this is not the year to do that. So definitely, if you're not feeling well, go home. Um, so wash your hands. That's another one. Um, if you cough or sneeze, wash your hands afterwards. That's one of the big ways to spread flu is you know, you cough or sneeze, and then you, you shake somebody's hand and then they rub their eyes or, or touch their mouth and, you know, they're, they're infected. So, um, you know, hand washing is a big one. Ed, we'll go to you for the next question. What point would you use to help get across to the 18 to 30 year olds to stop the spread of COVID-19? I'm looking at the age distribution in Scott County uh, as we speak, and the highest numbers uh, of those contracting the disease uh, lies with the 18 to age 28 range. So the point is you can get it. As a matter of fact, you're getting it at a higher rate than anybody else in the community. The next question we have is about some of the flu and the COVID-19 data. How are the health departments tracking both? I've been looking for stats for the 2019 to 2020 flu season. Um, I can just share, I know at least for Scott County in Iowa, um, since I work with our public information, flu is not a reportable disease since it is a seasonal illness that comes back year after year. And so places like schools report influenza-like illness. And so that's something that is reported on a regional level. The Iowa Department of Public Health provides um, influenza weekly reports on their website, and that will start as soon as um, flu season starts. You can find that from week to week, but it will not be something that you find numbers similar to COVID-19. So um, it is something the schools will be monitoring along with any other illness types such as COVID and will be reporting, um, but it just is data that looks different than what we have for a, an illness that is reportable such as COVID-19. Janet, how does that take place in um, Illinois and Rock Island County? Flu also is not a reportable disease unless someone has died or they are hospitalized in the ICU. Uh, we do track outbreaks in congregate care facilities, um, but it is uh, not something that is a you know tally of, of cases. The state will determine whether it's sporadic or widespread. And usually by after the Thanksgiving holiday, maybe the middle of December, it is widespread across the entire state. Thank you. It looks like the last question was a follow-up to the flu cases, so I think we provided information on that. Seeing that we have no additional questions, we'll go ahead and conclude our briefing for today. Uh, many thanks to Dr. Arnold for joining us. We know you've remain very busy in your clinic site and um, responding to COVID, so we appreciate that. Um, it does look like we've had one last question. I'll go to that, it's for public health, uh, but then we will conclude just to keep ourselves on schedule here. Um, Janet, do you have adequate staff to conduct contact tracing? There were additional contact tracers hired. As the number of cases rise, does the workload become more difficult? We do, uh, we have been hiring contact tracing, contact tracers. Um, we had several that were college students who um, are now heading back to school this week. Um, it is a ton of work. It's very labor intensive, but right now we believe that we can handle it with a 
especially when we get these new people hired in the next week or so. Ed, I know it's been a little bit different for Scott County. Can you respond to that for us? Yes, we do have uh, 19 staff trained in doing case investigations. And during the peak in July, they were very busy. They were working after hours and on weekends. Uh, but that has, the case numbers have gone down some, but they remain very busy trying to get in touch with people and identifying their contacts and talking with them. Okay, again, thank you to everyone participating on today's call. We appreciate um, the media's willingness to attend these and share the information that we provide. Um, we'll continue to share this as we continue to see unstable case numbers, as you see from the reports that we um, put out, both Rock Island County Daily and the state through the um, coronavirus.iowa.gov website. So we will be in touch for further briefings on COVID-19, and we thank you all for joining us. Have a great afternoon and a nice weekend.